What makes or breaks any story is its protagonist. There are eyes and ears to a brand new world, so they have to start out and remain a compelling figure in order to maintain an audience. Some might say that's one of many places where Jujutsu Kaisen shines. Obviously, the manga has something very special about it considering the massive fan base it has garnered in its four years of serialization. But Yuji Itadori might just be one of its most interesting parts. Keike Akutami has crafted one of the most complex and relatable protagonists in recent years, despite their claim that they don't like him that much. Honestly, Akutami is in the minority since Itadori has quickly found his way into the hearts of shonen fans worldwide. But what exactly makes him so special? What draws people to him? Today, we're going to be exploring everything surrounding Yuji Itadori, from his background to what makes him such an unconventional protagonist compared to other shonen leads. For the anime-only viewers, massive spoiler warning for the Shibuya arc and ongoing killing game arc. The Itadori Family Itadori's family is less like a tree at this point and more like an amorphous blob. The only member we've formally met is his paternal grandfather, Wasuke Itadori, who is introduced, then promptly dies in the same episode. We don't get much information about Wasuke at first, except that Yuji presumably lived with him for the majority of his life, and his grandson is the only person that visits him on his deathbed. The latter is what prompts Wasuke to encourage his grandson to do whatever he can to help people, form bonds, and ensure he won't die alone. I'll get more into Itadori's motivations later on, but it's important to note how seriously Yuji takes these words to heart. Wasuke and Itadori obviously shared a very strong bond. It's not until much later that we finally get a glimpse of Yuji's parents. His father, Jin Itadori, debuts in a flashback right at the start of the Itadori extermination arc. First, we see that Yuji certainly takes after the Itadori side of his family, with Jin and Wasuke having the same light, spiky hair. By all accounts, Jin seems like an incredibly doting father to his newborn son as he cradles him like he's the most precious thing on earth. This makes sense considering he's wanted a child for years but was unable to conceive with his first partner, Kaori, before she passed away, something Wasuke laments. Now, obviously, he loves his son and grandchild, but we see the rise of Wasuke's temper as he discusses Yuji's mother. He outright tells Jin, give up on that woman, you'll die. And honestly, there's a lot of validity behind that statement considering who Yuji's unnamed mother resembles. She appears from behind a doorway, sporting a short black bob and a very familiar scar across her forehead. Now, who this woman is, or rather was, and how she got this scar is still unexplained. But there's only one other person with that specific mark, Kenjaku. The worst sorcerer ever has a legacy of taking over people's bodies, namely Noritoshi Kamo and Suguru Geto. So possessing Yuji's mother would not be horribly out of character for him. Kenjaku's influence could also be an explanation for Yuji's superhuman physical prowess, but we'll get into that more later. But in a series like Jujutsu Kaisen, that's simply not enough twists and turns. Yuji is not an only child. He potentially has a pretty infamous trio of brothers, Choso, Esso, and Kechizu. Yes, the three death womb paintings, two of whom Itadori had a hand in killing, might be Yuji's big brothers. Since Yuji is also the spawn of Kenjaku, this makes sense. He, as Noritoshi Kamo, is responsible for the creation of the death womb paintings by forcing the procreation of half-human, half-curse hybrids 150 years prior. This is the reason Choso is still considered a curse despite possessing the Kamo family's blood manipulation curse technique. It's actually Choso who discovers Yuji might be his little brother after knocking him out in a flooded bathroom during the Shibuya incident. He receives a false memory of the four of them having a picnic. Yuji passes him a basket of food and calls him Big Bro. This causes the vengeful Chozo to have a minor crisis before exiting Shibuya Station. It's not until Kenjaku reveals his habit of body hopping and almost killing Chozo's little brother that the death painting bursts back onto the scene ready to defend his new family member. He immediately gravitated towards the battlefield because, much like with Esso and Kechizu, he could physically feel Yuji's suffering through a blood connection. Unfortunately, their time together is cut short when the two split up at the start of the Kulin game arc. However, Chozo does worry for his baby brother and visibly cries when the two have to separate. The Kulin game is still ongoing and there are plenty of opportunities for a brotherly reunion between the two, as well as exploring their newfound connection. But before we continue with our analysis of Yuji, if you want to see more character explanations like this, be sure to subscribe to the channel with notifications on to never miss an upload, and smash that like button for some plot armor today. Moral Alignment Now, Itadori is infamously a little bit dumb. He's even admitted it to himself. He acts mostly on instinct rather than strategy. That particular skill set is mostly within Megami's wheelhouse. 
But Itadori has a massive heart of gold, and that's mostly what guides him through life. As we said before, his grandfather was and continues to be Itadori's biggest guiding force. After all, Watsuke was his only parental figure and only mentor up until he met Gojo and Nanami at Tokyo Jujutsu High. It's Wasuke Itadori who gives his grandson the piece of advice he lives, and probably will die, by help as many people as you can. He chooses to help people by ensuring they receive a proper death, where they have no regrets and no baggage left on this mortal coil. He's so steadfast in his commitment to his grandfather's dying wish that he's willing to get repeatedly beaten up by Principal Yaga's puppet for it. After becoming Sukuna's vessel, Itadori's time frame for helping people is now much, much shorter. His lifespan has been drastically shortened, and realistically, his jujutsu sanctioned execution will happen before he's an adult, or even before his next birthday, but I'll elaborate on that more in a bit. So in order to make sure he also receives a proper death, he must ensure he dies without regrets. Not only is this motive what gets him into Tokyo Jujutsu High, it's what will inform most of his decisions in battle from here on. His attitude during fights is very self-sacrificial. He's always willing to put his own life at risk to ensure his friends are fine. And if you hurt one of his friends, God help you, because you are now on Yuji's rarely seen bad side. His dedication towards keeping his friends safe is first witnessed during the first fight he has with Mahito. After seeing and experiencing the anger and grief his close friend Junpei Yoshino had after the murder of his mother, Yuji tried with all his might to stop their fight and bring Junpei with him to Tokyo Jujutsu High. He actually had his friend convinced, until Mahito came out of the shadows and transfigured Junpei, killing him in front of Yuji. This started an arc-long grudge between the two. Their clashing opinions on the value of human life fueled the growing disdain Yuji has for the curse. Even Yuji's dedication to trying to save people angers the king of curses that has made his home in his body. The only time Sukuna has ever shown mercy to a possible victim is towards Yuji's closest ally, Megami Fushiguro. He actively and willingly spares Megami in their first fight after he ripped out Yuji's heart to gain control of the body. Not only that, but the King of Curses even saves the Ten Shadows user, after he nearly killed himself by releasing the General Mahoraka Shikigami. This restraint is terribly uncharacteristic for Sukuna, and something tells me that the motivations Sukuna has for saving Megami aren't solely steeped in his own selfish desires, but more on that later. As his time in Jujutsu society progresses, and as the hold Sukuna has on him gets stronger, Yuji becomes an even more emotionally complex character. The more he sees people and even curses die in front of him or at his own hands, the more he becomes disillusioned with the black and white morality of Jujutsu sorcery. He begins feeling increasingly conflicted with seeing his mentors and friends suffer for reasons nobody fully understands. This all comes to a head in the Shibuya incident, when Sukuna is forcibly released due to Itadori being force-fed at least 10 of his fingers. Now, Yuji's obviously taken issue with the King of Curses' very nonchalant attitude towards mass murder, but having to essentially sit back and watch the carnage Sukuna wreaks at Shibuya Station is enough to psychologically break him. He manages to get back into the fray for the sake of a near comatose Megami and the rest of his friends. But once again, Mahito comes back to psychologically manipulate him. Yuji completely blows apart Nanami, the closest thing to a father figure Yuji's had since the death of his grandfather. As a follow-up, Mahito then almost kills Nobara, just to prove to Yuji that his care for human life is a weakness. This makes him realize he is nothing more than a cog in the Jujutsu Saidi machine. It's an abrupt but not unearned 180 turn from his previously more optimistic perspective on his purpose in the world. Who amongst us would not be a bit nihilistic after seeing two of our closest friends brutally killed? This also means he harbors less guilt about exercising curses, especially Mahito. However, he still carries the shame of essentially aiding and abetting the murderers Mimiko and Nanako, who honestly weren't villains but rather misguided and grieving. His guilt comes to a head during his battle with disgraced lawyer and culling game superstar Hiromi Higuruma. His domain expansion Deadly Sentencing and Shigigami Judge Man essentially place Itadori on trial for all the wrongs he's committed. This starts with him entering a pachinko parlor while underage, a running joke with Akutami who got in trouble for including it, but quickly turns serious. Higuruma brings up the mass murders that Yuji technically committed on October 31st, 2018. He immediately responds, yeah. I did that. I'm not lying and I won't deny it. 
Even Higuruma is confused as to why he confessed, since it was Sukuna that did the crime, not Yuji, and he immediately dispels his curse technique to negotiate with him. The two bond over how awful it feels to kill of your own free will, even more so than killing from a back seat, which finally gives Yuji a moment of catharsis. This confrontation is also important for a reason I'll get into a bit later, but for now, it's the new solidification of where Yuji's morals lie, and how he feels about his position in Jujutsu society. Itadori's power and potential So we've established that Yuji Itadori is something not quite human, but his motivations for joining Tokyo Jujutsu Tech and continuing to fight are. However, we've barely discussed what exactly makes him an asset to Jujutsu society, as well as why his position as Sukuna's vessel is so special. First, let's discuss what his stats were before the whole eating a finger incident. He was already showing signs of being superhumanly fast and strong, to the point where his high school's track and field coach was begging him to join. Actually, what caught Megami's attention in the first place, before the cursed object in his backpack, was the fact that he had bent a goalpost with a shot put ball. He also finished running a 50 meter sprint in about 3 seconds, meaning he can outrun a grizzly bear. It is possible his gifted physical prowess comes from the fact that he's possibly not human. He and Choso both share the same physical gifts, which made them equally matched opponents in Shibuya. Whatever the reason, his strength and speed were absolutely nuts even before he became the host of the King of Curses. In battle, he's both a strong offensive and defensive asset. Again, his inhuman strength and speed give him the ability to land hits on curses that even experienced Jujutsu sorcerers have a hard time touching. A prime example of this is his fight with Toto against special grade curse Hanami. The more experienced Toto has a hard time landing a strike on the curse, while Yuji is easily able to rapid fire kick the curse into a defensive position. His superhuman speed also makes him a strong defensive fighter, since he's easily able to avoid quick hits. He does this during his fights with Chozo and Mahito in the Shibuya incident. But perhaps his biggest strength as a fighter, not including what he can do with cursed energy, is his proficiency in martial arts. This makes him one of the best hand-to-hand -hand combatants in the entire series. It's what gains him Toto's respect, and it's what helps him in close combat fights, especially before he got a handle on how to use cursed energy. Now, obviously hand-to-hand -hand combat and superhuman strength and speed aren't what Yuji solely relies on in fights. He is a Jujutsu Sorcerer, and thus has the ability to manipulate cursed energy. Considering Yuji's only been aware of Jujutsu Sorcery for about 4 months or so, the fact that he's able to manipulate cursed energy is incredibly impressive, especially for someone that labeled himself as unintelligent. His only proper training was the movie-watching speedrun and the brief Kyoto Sister School event before the latter was interrupted by Kenjaku's henchmen. Or maybe hench curses? Most of Yuji's training in Jujutsu Sorcery has been trial by fire, yet he's been able to learn and master difficult techniques like Black Flash and Divergent Fist. This is a testament to how much of a natural Jujutsu Sorcerer he is. Even Nanami, who is impressed with very little in general, openly enjoys working with Yuji and his proficiency at learning. But what use is learning how to use cursed techniques without an abundance of cursed energy? Luckily for Yuji, he has it in spades. Much of the massive amounts of cursed energy Itadori possesses come from being Sukuna's vessel. With special training, Satoru Gojo surmises that he could reach the special grade status held by the likes of himself and Yuta Okotsu. Actually, a lot of the advantages Itadori has in battle come from Sukuna. He's immune to poison, as demonstrated in his fight with Choso and his fight with Junpei. He is also able to resist Mahito's idle transfiguration, since Sukuna will not let Yuji's soul be manipulated, which is probably the only nice thing Sukuna has done for his host. Additionally, the two have an ongoing binding vow, which Yuji has forgotten about under the conditions of the agreement that keeps him alive, but also gives Sukuna a trigger word for instant release. This furthers their almost symbiotic relationship. Sukuna gives Yuji massive amounts of cursed energy and powers that take years to hone, while Sukuna can gain full control of his host's body with the utterance of Enchain. The fact that Yuji is able to contain Sukuna at all, much less be able to control him if he comes out, is quite honestly a miracle. Being the host of a curse is already a one in a million chance, but being able to host the most powerful curse in the existence of Jujutsu Sorcery is even lower. I'd actually wager that the reason Sukuna has spared Megami's life multiple times isn't just for selfish reasons, but because he's aware of how much Megami means to his host. Nobody that Yuji is close with has come to harm as a direct result of Sukuna, and I think that's because Yuji's grip on the curse is much stronger than he cares to admit. 
Again, the reasoning for why Sukuna and Yuji are able to work so well together is a mystery, but I'd bet it all comes back to Kenjaku's influence on Yuji's DNA. An unconventional MC. So I've just explained everything that makes Yuji, well, Yuji. He's a really complex and compelling character with a big heart and a murky origin story. But there are plenty of shonen protagonists that also share those qualities. So what makes Yuji Itadori different from all the rest? First, Yuji is probably one of the most relatable shonen protagonists in a while. Before being the vessel of a powerful curse and a jujutsu sorcerer, he was a normal teen boy. He's got a massive crush on Jennifer Lawrence, he reads manga and loves bad horror movies, and he loves spending time with his friends. I mean, he even snuck into an 18-plus establishment for fun. At heart, he's still just a regular teenager who wants to find a balance between fulfilling his own life goals and saving people. He also reacts to being thrown not just into a new supernatural subsect of the world, but also being told he's due for execution like any normal person would. Complete confusion sprinkled with the proper amount of terror. Unlike most shonen protagonists, Yuji is not on the hero's journey. He's nowhere close to being a hero. Yuji is on a survival mission, especially considering that his future is still up in the air, and the Jujutsu higher-ups had expedited his execution prior to the culling game. He's also completely been broken down by the system he was forced into. The curse that he's hosting has no qualms about kicking him while he's down. His mentors are either dead or sealed away. One of his closest friends is in a state of suspended animation, and the other has been separated from him for quite a while. His biggest antagonist was hell-bent on psychologically destroying him, until he was eliminated by an even larger psychological threat. Obviously, having your spirit not just broken, but stomped on and completely disintegrated is not a game-changer in terms of shonen narratives. But how Yuji treats seeing death and destruction is honestly more understandable compared to other stories made for the same demographic. Instead of shrugging it off and moving on to the next battle, Yuji actually takes the time to mourn the loss of life. His battle with Higuruma is perfect evidence of how much he blames himself for the deaths he either inadvertently caused or had a direct hand in. But perhaps the most interesting thing about Yuji is that he's barely the protagonist of his own narrative at this point. After consuming Sukuna's finger, his life has been out of his control thanks to an angry curse living rent-free in his body. That's not what I'm referring to, though. The last time Itadori showed up in the manga was over 30 chapters ago when he was talking to Higuruma. And the last time he consistently showed up in Jujutsu Kaisen as the sole protagonist would arguably be the death painting arc. He slowly moved away from being the sole focus of the manga to being one part of a massive world. It's not uncommon for a shonen to have multiple leads. Tritagonists are central to other big shonen like Naruto and My Hero Academia. But the three leads usually share an even distribution of page time. Since the Shibuya arc, there really hasn't been a single lead for the series. Many side characters like Maki and Yuta are now getting their own mini-arcs, and more key players like Kinji Hikari are finally getting proper introductions. The structure that Akutami has stuck by since the start of Shibuya is not conducive to having a single protagonist, but rather focusing on an ensemble cast and how they're all being affected by the same oppressive system. I think this creates a more compelling narrative overall, but it does put Yuji, who was set up as the lead in the first chapter of Jujutsu Kaisen, on the sidelines. Perhaps this narrative choice reflects the lack of control any single Jujutsu sorcerer or curse has over the trajectory of their futures. Or maybe it's because Akutami wanted to change the narrative structure of the story away from that of a typical shonen battle manga. Whatever the rationale is, Yuji is no longer the lead. And that's okay. There are still plenty of mysteries around him to unravel, and as Kenjaku becomes an even bigger part of the narrative with the Kulin Game and Tokyo Colony arcs, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of Yuji's past and present. Yuji Itadori is an enigma of a character. He's not even the hero of his own story, but he's compelling enough to keep us coming back for more. From his messy origins, to his reckless behavior, to his unwavering dedication to keeping his friends, or rather his newfound family, safe while still reckoning with the destructive capabilities he's been cursed with, this young man has a lot going on for and against him. Whenever Gege Akutami decides to bring him back into the fray of the killing game, rest assured more chaotic goodness will follow. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Jack Stansbury, and have an amazing rest of your day.